Hello, everyone that's joined us so far. We're going to give it a few minutes just to give people a chance to uh, join us here. And then we'll get started probably in about three or four minutes. And if you're just joining us, we're going to give it another minute and let any last minute folks join and then we'll get started. Okay, uh, I think we will go ahead and get started with tonight's workshop. So good evening to everyone and welcome to Fall Yard Maintenance, which is the third and final natural yard care workshop in our online fall series. I do see a lot of familiar names from the past couple of weeks. So thank you to everyone for sticking with us and it's good to see you all again, even if I can't really see you all again. So first I'm gonna introduce myself and talk about how tonight's workshop will work. And then I'll tell you a bit about tonight's presenter, Selena Legrano from Tilt Alliance before we jump into her presentation. So my name is Christy Cox with the City of Bothell Surface Water Division. And I help residents learn how to protect our, our local streams and rivers from pollution. One of the ways we can do this is by reducing the amount of polluted stormwater that runs off of our properties when it rains. So basically rain picks up whatever it touches and carries it to the nearest storm drain or body of water, which means that yard chemicals like pesticides and fertilizers can end up in our local streams and often do. This harms the fish and wildlife and makes the water pretty unhealthy. So that's why we wanna teach you how to use natural yard care techniques for healthy yards and gardens. So I'm really excited that so many of you are joining us tonight. Now I wanna talk about how tonight's workshop will work. First, tonight's workshop will be recorded and we'll make that link available on our website by this Friday afternoon. Next, I wanna ask everyone to please mute your microphone if you haven't already and turn off your video during the presentation just so we can try to avoid any frozen screens or glitches. A lot of you already submitted some specific questions when you registered for this workshop and we'll try to answer most of those during the presentation itself. But if you do have other questions, please just type them in the chat box and we'll get to as many of them as we can during the Q&A session that follows the workshop. We are scheduled to end at 8.30 tonight. So if time runs out and we're not able to get to your specific question, 
In the email that I sent you earlier today, you have a link to the Garden Hotline's website where you can ask your questions online or by phone. We have a few yard related questions that we'd like to ask you both at the beginning of the workshop and again at the end of the Q&A session to help us understand the effectiveness of this workshop. For those participants that complete the polls, tomorrow morning I will enter your name into a drawing for either one of two books about gardening or an hour and a half one-on-one -on -one online consultation with one of Tilth Alliance's gardening experts. During that consultation, you'll be able to get specific recommendations about your yard and garden. And tomorrow I'll be mailing out prizes to the winners from all from the previous workshops as well. So the two books that we're going to be giving away for tonight's workshop are Cass Turnbull's Guide to Pruning, which we also have listed as a reference on the resource page for this workshop. And the other one is plant combinations for an abundant garden. In fact, Selena, if you wouldn't mind, can you put up that first poll so that we can have people answer that while I'm doing your introduction? Yes. Okay. And also I wanna remind everyone that we are recording this workshop. So without further ado, tonight's speaker is Selena Legrano from Tilth Alliance. Selena has a strong connection to plants and the environment. She has a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Ecology and a minor in Horticulture from Washington State University and an MBA in Sustainable Systems from Pinchot University. She loves working within the local food system. So after landscaping in our region for over a decade, she began volunteering in the Food Hub program at Tilth Alliance. Some of Selena's goals are to help bridge the gap in food access to our neighborhoods and to expand urban gardening and the farming community. She has run her own landscaping business for over five years with the goal of connecting her clients to their gardens and plants. And she's transformed that business into a consulting company that focuses on community, sorry, community engagement and development and revitalizing the local food systems through edible gardens. If you attended any of our previous workshops in this series, which I think many of you did, then you already know that Selena is a wealth of knowledge. So I want to say thank you to Selena for being here. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. I'm going to give just another 30 seconds to see if we can get some more people to enter in the poll. Um, and while that's happening, I just want to say thank you for everyone that's joined the last couple of times and then for you here today. Um, there is a lot of information to get covered as always. Um, there will be time at the end for questions and then also, um, as Christy said, please email or call us if you have further questions. There is a lot of resources on the City of Bothell website too that I put in um, and you will be able to go back and see this presentation again also. Let's see if we can get one or two more people and then I'm going to stop the poll and share with what we've got. Awesome. Okay, so just so everyone can see. We've got about half of you that have done non-organic solutions in your garden. A couple of people have contacted us before. I hope after this, we will have more people contacting the garden hotline. Um, and then looks like people are reaching out to many different ways to access information, which is great because there is no one source that is better than the other. So thank you very, very much. Okay. And then Christy, I don't know if you are able to snap those pictures just in case. Yep, I have what I need, thank you. Awesome, all right, with that, I am going to get started. And I am gonna turn my video off just so that I limit any sort of potential issues down the road too. Okay, so with that, fall yard maintenance. So to just kind of highlight some of the main areas that we're gonna cover, looking at really understanding the Pacific Northwest climate, Com, um, companion planting, fall maintenance, and then also a section on pruning. Um, all of these are, they're, each one of them could be their own topic um, and presentation. So this is gonna be a pretty high level with some little specifics. Um, but like I said, look at the resource page and please put questions in the chat box um, as we go through. 
So understanding the Pacific Northwest climate. Um, we have a very unique type of climate here. Um, so one of the things to think about is when looking at the USDA and sunset zones. So these are the different ways that we can determine what our hardiness levels are in the Northwest and all over the United States. One thing that's really important to take note of is that there is two different types of um, zones that you'll see. So the USDA is the one that you're going to see on plant tags when you go into the store and that's talking about the average minimum temperature that those plants can handle and that's how they determine what plants can go where. Whereas the sunset zones are really looking at a more broader type of a landscape so they're looking at not only moisture levels but also um, the length of growing season, the winter temperatures, they're taking into account a more full rounded view, but they are only focused in kind of the northwest and the western side of the state. So it's something just to think about if you have a sunset book, um, some sunset magazines that are talking about the different hardness, it is a different type of a hardness zone. So you'll see here um, the picture on the right that shows just kind of the sound uh, it mentions and it shows that we are in a what they say a zone four. So that is referring to the sunset zones. And so on the left, you can see the whole Washington state map. We are the green color and the green color is an 8A or an 8B. And that is what the USDA zones are referring to as our, um, our hardiness or our minimum or average minimum temperatures. So it's important to look at because the eastern side of the state is considered a zone four for USDA. And so it can get a little confusing, which is why it's important to just make sure that when you're looking at a plant tag in the store that you recognize it's the USDA plant zone that they're referring to. So when thinking about planting a garden and specifically having something in the Pacific Northwest, it's because we don't have super, super cold temperatures, it's really important and a really nice way to try and have year round interest. So thinking about something that is from spring all the way through fall and even winter. So whether or not that's gonna be leaves or fruit, maybe it's gonna be flowers, maybe it's gonna be the bark color. Um, thinking about really trying to attract those beneficial insects or different wildlife into your garden. And then also being able to look at being able to have different edibles that you can work in. So maybe you want to put a blueberry plant in the middle of your shrub bed. Um, just thinking about the ways that those different types of plants need water. Vegetable gardens need a lot more water than a shrub bed oftentimes. So just thinking about that as you're planting that garden. Um, there's This picture is an example of a apple tree trellis or a spalier that created a fence. So thinking about different ways you can have different functions in your garden. Height variation, um, having a canopy layer versus having a shrub layer. It adds diversity for different wildlife and also different interest in your garden. Textures, mass groupings, odds and thirds, and then including evergreen and deciduous. Mixing these all together is a great way to add interest and in different types of nooks and crannies that offer something year round. So this is just kind of looking at the kind of a permaculture way of looking at stuff, thinking about um, how a forest or a natural environment is. So as I mentioned with the different canopy layers, you have the larger things up top as you work down through the different layers, the lower trees, shrubs, um, different herbaceous or perennial type things. You have different types of lower ground covers um, and then kind of working them all together. So think about that natural environment when you're trying to create a what they call a forest garden or a guild or a way to just kind of incorporate all those different types of functions together. Another thing to think about is grouping plants with like needs. And this is really important when you think of different water tolerances um, and then also thinking about sun versus shade. So making sure you're grouping drought tolerant plants together and you're not trying to put a blueberry in with your, um, your lavender or your rosemary because their needs on both water and sun are different and you're gonna be fighting those plants constantly as you go and you're going to end up having disease or pest problems or just unhappy plants that you're going to um, going to have to replace at some point. 
Um, the other thing that I guess just think about too is just it's saving you a little bit of money too in that sense because you're giving them the right amount of water and you're not kind of overdoing it. You're also looking at those soil conditions and making sure that those are working for the types of plants that you have. So we like to think of Washington natives as one of the ones um, to really kind of focus on a lot of times because they do know our natural environment. They do well without added irrigation um, unless they're in a place that they're not supposed to be, which is why grouping them or making sure you're putting them in the right place is so important. They're oftentimes more pest and disease resistant because they are in their native space. Um, so it's just some examples of some of the different natives that we have in the different areas you would put them. Ground covers such as ginger, sword ferns, um, salal, trilliums, even the low growing Oregon grape. Some of the shrubs, dogwood, snowberries, huckleberries, mock orange, um, flowering currant, all of these you're gonna find in either shade or sun, in wet environments versus dry environments. Uh, there's a lot of different options out there to be able to add diversity into your house and your garden. Small trees such as the vine maple or elderberry, and then some of the larger trees that we have around. So the Douglas fir, the big leaf maple, hemlock, and also the red cedar. Um, oftentimes a lot of these also have some sort of food source sometimes, um, either for wildlife, but also for you as a person too, such as the huckleberry, um, salal, Oregon grape, you can eat those. Um, and even the elderberries are great for making elderberry syrup. So just some of the other things to think about of having dual purpose, um, in with the natives also. So companion planting. So this is um, in the simplest terms, companion planting is the technique of combining two plants for a particular purpose. Um, oftentimes it's more than just two plants, but it's just a way to think about putting these all together. There is lots of different ways that we do companion planting. Um, oftentimes people think of putting marigolds with tomatoes. Um, but there is many other different reasons and different ways that we do actually companion planting. So I'm gonna go through a couple of what those different techniques are. So one of the things that people often do and think about um, is shallow and deep rooting plants. So when you're combining two different types of plants, think about their root structure. So in the far, far left there, you can see the picture of a multiple different types of plants together. So there's lettuces and carrots kind of intermixed. And they work together because the lettuce has a one little kind of root that goes straight down, but it's really more of a shallow rooting type of a plant. And so because of that, you're able to then intermix something that has a deeper root a little on the side because it's not taking up that same root space. And it's pretty impressive too, as you can see here, each one of these lines are a one vertical foot. So a carrot has that one tap root that we eat which is usually six, eight inches, but the actual root hairs of that plant are going down and potentially down six or seven feet into the ground. Whereas the lettuce is only going about a foot down into the ground. So you can work these two plants around each other. Oftentimes you'll see lettuce planted underneath tomatoes um, because of a similar, a similar reason. Short and tall growing plants. Um, these can be for multiple different things. Um, oftentimes you can create shade by doing kind of a vertical garden. So in that picture on the left, you can see there's cucumbers or squash that are growing over a hoop, and then you have lettuce being planted underneath. And so you're creating shade for the lettuce. As the summer goes on and it gets hotter and brighter outside, the cucumbers or the squash will cover them up and shade them from the hot sun. And then same with the top picture there, there's tomatoes growing and then the lettuce growing underneath. And so you'll plant lettuce earlier in the year. And then as the tomatoes get up and get taller and the sun gets hotter, they're starting to shade those lettuce so that you can have them growing for a longer period of time. It's also important to think about when you're trying to decide which direction the sun's coming. So if you have something like your tomatoes or beans or peas, putting them to either in the back of a bed if you want to be able to have enough sun in the front or if you want to plant them in the front to shade that area in the back so you can have something say like lettuce or spinach that needs that cooler temperatures. So it's very important to think about the direction the sun is going and then also what types of plants you're planting together in these spaces. 
thinking about different harvest times and seasons. Um, so it's important to think about spring versus summer and then fall and winter. So we'll oftentimes plant stuff in the early spring and it can either be a short season that you're gonna pick within a couple of months or it's gonna be something that lasts a lot longer and you're picking at the end of the year. And so think about how to partner those together so that you're utilizing your space efficiently. Thinking about fall and winter. Oftentimes plants that we eat in the fall and the winter are planted later in the season. And so you're having to look at how you're gonna partner the spring and summer plants with your fall and winter plants. There are some plants that we plant in um, like vegetables, say um, beets or cabbages, we'll plant in July or August that we won't be harvesting or eating until the following spring. And so you're taking up that, that space and you're kind of thinking about how you can partner those different plants together so that you can have a long season of harvest but still be able to use up as much of that space as possible. So I mentioned um, different harvest times, so short season versus long season. So when thinking about these, we have annuals, biennials, and perennials, oftentimes with our vegetable gardens. And so looking at an annual long season would be something like a tomato, a pepper, an eggplant, um, even stuff like squashes and cucumbers, things that take quite a bit of time that you can usually only plant once throughout the year, but are gonna take up that entire growing season. And then stuff like a short season annual. So lettuce, um, radishes, beets, carrots, these are all considered shorter season types of plants. Um, and then biennials, and so these are most of our brassicas. So like kale, um, some of the cabbages, and then even some of the root crops too, if you were to let them fully go through their whole process. Um, so a biennial is gonna be something that you would, it's gonna bloom or go to seed the second season, and then it would be done. And then something like a perennial. So artichokes, um, asparagus are all gonna be in your perennial family. And so those are gonna be there for that whole time. You're not gonna be moving them. So making sure you have that space and that you're working through trying to partner stuff together. One thing I've seen people do and I've heard of is planting strawberries with your asparagus because the strawberries, when they're fruiting and doing what they need to do is after asparagus is already harvested. And because strawberries have a really shallow root system, they don't impact or affect our, um, asparagus. So it's a great way to be able to combine those two different types of crops together in the same space. Another reason that we do um, companion planting is for different types of fertilizing needs. Um, one of the really common ones that most people know about in the Northwest is called the Three Sisters. And this is a indigenous way of combining plants and using them to be able to work together. So the Three Sisters is squash, corn, and beans. And you can see on the bottom left picture, um, you plant them all at the same time. And what happens is the corn grows up and creates a natural trellis for the beans to grow up. And the beans are adding nitrogen into the soil, which is what the little nodules are on the, um, the root system on the right. And then the squash and corn are getting nitrogen from the beans and the squash is shading the soil, keeping it moist and cool for all those plants to be able to grow together. So it's a great way to have three different crops all in one space and they're all kind of benefiting and working together throughout the year. There's a lot of different examples of this. This is probably the most common one that people know of. And then pest control. And this is one that I find very interesting. Um, like I said, a lot of times people think of marigolds and tomatoes. Marigolds and calendula are very common ones for pest suppression and then also for attracting different beneficial insects. One thing that's interesting that African marigolds specifically repel nematodes. Um, and that's a really common problem in the garden. I have a huge problem with them in my garden right now. Um, and I wish I had planted more African marigolds in my garden. Um, and then the idea of aleopathy, um, and that's looking at um, things that are potentially causing issues or changing the different ways that um, you have germination issues. So black walnut actually suppresses germination in seedlings. And so if you ever get black walnut bark, you don't ever wanna put it on a veggie bed 
because it can suppress any sort of germination of your seeds. It's great for if you're going to put it in between pathways and stuff like that, but just being aware of that if you're ever getting black walnut to not put it in your veggie beds. Rye, which is a common cover crop that is used, um, actually helps to suppress weeds. So once it's chopped up and mixed back into the soil, it helps to keep weeds away. And then there's a great use of using them for trap crops. Um, and so one of the really common ones that people see is that nasturtiums. So the flower on the very bottom picture is an edible flower that is spicy and delicious. I recommend everyone to try it. Um, but it also is a favorite for aphids. And so aphids will actually come through and be attracted to the nasturtiums um, and then pull them away from other types of plants such as beans um, or some of the other types of brassicas that um, aphids love. And then roses are super common at the end of vineyards and they use them as a trap crop to be able to come through. Let's see here if we can just mute. We got someone that's through. Okay. Um, and so then the last thing is just attracting the beneficial insects. And so this is just good because there's so many different insects that are actually eating those different pests. And so it's important to be able to just have flowers and diversity around for that also. So when thinking about fall maintenance, um, it is a very common time of the year to just kind of rebring your garden all back together. There's a lot of different parts that go along with that. And so I'm going to kind of highlight some of the main things that are done in the fall. And please put any other questions in the chat box and I will try and answer them at the end of this. So one of the things to think about first is lawns. So just a little quick kind of basics of what not lawns need. Um, they really need six to eight hours of sun. And if it's too shady, that's oftentimes why we have moss growing in our um, lawns in the northwest. Um, and so there's different alter alternatives that you can do. There's clovers, there's yarrow, there's a lot of different lawn alternatives that do really well in those different types of environments. They need a lot more water than people realize. Um, one inch per six weeks, or per week, sorry, for it to a six inch depth. And so there's a technique called the tuna can technique where you put a small can similar to the size of a tuna can and you would put it out and let your sprinklers go. And once that fills up with that water, that's how much you would need for that amount of time for that week. It takes a lot longer to fill up than people realize. Um, so just to kind of a way to check to see if you're giving your lawns enough water. Um, drainage is super important. And with our heavy rains that we get, it can oftentimes be really hard on our lawns, especially with the type of soil that we have in the Northwest. So practicing aeration and then also dethatching, putting compost, and reseeding regularly really helps to increase the drainage and have good healthy lawns. So when growing these lawns, mowing the height to about two inches um, minimum to help outcompete weeds and it helps to shade the soil which helps to conserve that moisture. As we go into winter it's really important to not mow too low um, and then doing what we call grass cycling which is actually when you leave a little bit of the Bit of lawn on your actual lawn after you mowed it. And what that does is if you, it works it back into the soil and it acts as a natural fertilizer going into fall. So this time of the year, you kind of mow a couple more, more frequently so that you can get these little tiny bits going in rather than having big chunks of lawn sitting on there. Um, using natural organic fertilizer instead of chemical fertilizers is much better. It's a lot easier on the lawn. The lawn's able and all of the, org um, beneficial organisms and mycorrhizae and everything in the soil are able to um, work much better that way. We like to not add phosphorus to our lawn unless you absolutely need to. Phosphorus is a limiting, is not something we generally have a limit of, and if you have too much, plants can't uptake it, and then it's washed out into our waterways, um, causing a lot of problems in um, algae growth in our waters. So fall, um, it's really a great time to do any sort of reseeding or renovation. And that's pretty much September to mid-October. So we're getting to almost the end of when you would wanna be doing any of this work. And that's mainly just because it's gonna get too cold and you want that seed to be able to germinate. Um, aeration is a great time to do. 
And like I said, what it does is it just kind of pulls little plugs out and allows more air space between so that the roots have somewhere to go. Adding about a quarter inch of compost on top of your lawn and just raking it down helps to build the organic matter and help add natural fertilizer to the lawn. Dethatching is done um, if you have too much of the kind of dead grass um, built up in between. So in this picture, um, it's pretty much the brown part in between the dirt on the bottom and then the grass on top. Um, if you have more than an inch or so of that thatch, it starts to make the grass not be able to grow as well. And that's a lot of times when you're gonna end up having a lot of weed problems. So dethatching can be, usually it's every couple of years, but you just kind of need to look at how, what your levels are to determine if you need to do it. And then fertilizing is really best done um, pretty much September through probably early October. And it's because the grass and a lot of plants, they're building that root structure to be able to get through next year. And they're putting their energy into that root structure, making them healthier going through the winter and then being able to kind of just do a big jump start in the spring. Oops, excuse me, there it is, okay. So why we plant in the fall? So one of the biggest reasons that we plant in the fall is because of our soil temperatures. Um, and I will show you a little bit more about all of this in a minute. Um, plant establishment, it's a great time to just give plants a little bit of a good head start. Our winter rains are great to be able to help. Spring bulbs, it's less stress on the plants and it's also comfortable for us to be working in. So as you can see on this map, um, around so this was a couple years ago this map was this picture was taken but it's the end of september and you can see in seattle we still had soil temperatures in the mid to high 50s and so there's still plenty of soil heat to be able to get things to germinate so that's why stuff like our grasses can still go in at this time um and also why you can still be digging in the ground and you still have enough heat for the roots to be able to still grow um, when you're starting to plant. So another thing to think of is less, the cooler the temperatures, the plants aren't transpiring as much. So it's a lot less stressful on them when you're planting and moving or transplanting them. By adding mulch into the soil, you're helping to regulate the temperatures. You're creating this little barrier and it, um, the extra nutrients that's coming from that mulch is also helping for the healthy roots to grow. Making sure that you're putting plants in the right place so that you don't have to keep fighting them down the road. Um, you don't want to have them too close to tree or to houses or utility lines. Making sure that you're thinking about how you're setting up the water maintenance for those different types of plants and making sure that you're realizing that the plant you're planting, how big it's going to be so that you don't have to do so much pruning which can be a lot of work for you and also is extra stressful on the plants if you keep having to, to prune them so much. So our winter rains, as you can see here, and as I'm sure many of you have realized, um, is really fall and spring. Um, one of the really big things to take note of and that a lot of people don't realize is that our June rains, when we do get them, it's actually kind of what a lot of our larger trees and shrubs need to be able to get through our pretty much of a drought, July, August, and even sometimes September. And so in the last couple of years, we haven't had as much rain in June. And it's part of why some of our bigger trees and shrubs that are more established are struggling a little bit more and need a little bit more supplemental water in the summertime. So it's really important that we get those June rains to help those trees make it through. So when thinking about smart watering, um, this is important um, just as a planning for the year. Now is a good time to kind of reassess and think about if you need to move something, if you have ir automatic irrigation or a drip that you might need to scoot around. Um, it's also important to think about for fall and winter that you need to make sure that you're shutting down a lot of your automatic um, irrigation, you're rolling up your hoses and making sure you're um, frost proofing different stuff. You also want to make sure that you're thinking about reducing the amount of water that you do have leading up into fall and winter because it does help to harden off plants too. 
Um, so kind of similar to how we put vegetable starts going out in the spring, we harden them off by getting them used to the sun. We harden them off by kind of slowing down that water that they're getting, so they're kind of toughening up a little bit going into winter. It's also important to think about um, any sort of containers or plants that you have under the eaves, making sure that they're still getting water through the winter time because they do still need water and they're more protected um, when a freeze comes if they're wet versus dry. So making sure that you're still paying attention to that going into fall and winter. So one of the best time to take a soil test is now. So in the fall is a great time to do it. Um, it gives you a baseline for where where your soil's at and what maybe has been taken out of it. So whether this is for your lawns, your vegetable gardens, or if you have a spot in your yard that maybe was showing kind of some weird like disease type stuff or the leaves weren't looking quite right, it's a really good time to just kind of take a, a step back and just kind of see what's going on. Um, we also unfortunately have a lot of problems with different toxins that are in sometimes of our, our yards. Anything built before 1978 potentially has lead in the paint and so it's important to get a soil test for that. Different orchards, um, industrial sites, downwind of cement plants, um, busy highways all can have different pesticides or chemicals involved in them. There's also the Asarco smelter plume which is down in South King County and Pierce County and that um, unfortunately put a lot of arsenic and lead into the air which then fell down into the soil and that has caused a lot of problems down at that end. So just something to be aware of um, and to look at. Another reason that we do soil testing now is that oftentimes some of the stuff that we add into our soil to help with the fertility issues can take a long time to actually fully work into the soil and become available to plants which is also why it's a good time to do it. So when looking at growing healthy soil, um, one of the biggest things that we can do is adding, whoop, adding compost to your soil, mulch of different types, cover crops, natural, using natural organic fertilizers and not synthetic fertilizers, doing aeration and top dressing of those lawns, avoiding chemicals altogether. Um, and then sheet mulching is just a great way to be able to jumpstart a new garden space. I'm going to go through some of these a little bit more detail. So when trying to think about the different types of mulches, um, they're really there to be able to conserve moisture, they moderate soil temperature, they keep weeds down, they also add nutrients back into the soil as they break down. So there's a lot of different types that we have out there. Um, wood chips are really great for perennials, trees and shrub beds, pathways. Compost is oftentimes used in vegetable gardens and annual beds. Leaves are great for everywhere, and they're honestly a great free source um, to be able to put in. Try not to collect any leaves that might be on a roadway where they could have some sort of chemicals on them, but from a park or your yard, they're a great way to just help to, to add a little extra protection around different plants. Straw is great for vegetable gardens and also perennials. And then there's also always the commercial mixes, which is like manure or different wood products. Um, gravel just for pathways. You don't really ever want to put that into a bed. And then cover crops are great for veggie gardens and also for some smaller containers. So a little detail about cover crops just because now is one of the best times to put in cover crops. Um, we oftentimes use them to help protect when our rains come through in the winter time because they leach a lot of nutrients out. And so that cover crop creates a carpet almost. And so it helps to keep the water from hitting the soil directly and it has to kind of bounce around the leaves, which helps to prevent compaction. It also can add nitrogen into the soil. It helps the soil to um, enrich with microorganisms. It adds organic matter back into the soil once you are kind of done turning it in in the springtime. And because it is such a thick cover, it can help to keep be weeds at bay. And then also, like I mentioned, the rye can also help inhibit certain types of weeds to grow. And then it's also what we kind of, they fall into what we call green manures. And so it's a, um, non-animal type of a manure that can be added in and they fall into two different categories the annual grasses 
and legumes, which I will go into a little bit more detail. So the annual grasses, and these are ryegrass, barley, oats, and winter wheat, are oftentimes um, planted to help with being able to add a, a substantial amount of organic matter. Um, they can get anywhere from three to four feet tall. So you have quite a bit of growth to be able to chop down. Their roots, as you can see, create a pretty fibrous mat. And so they really help with breaking up clay and also helping to add organic matter into the sandy soil so that you don't have um, as much of a drainage issue. It kind of helps to counteract both of those. Um, you just want to make sure you cut them down before they go to seed because that is when you can have a problem with them growing back. Um, so they are annuals, they're not going to kind of come back every year, but that seed head can reseed itself. And then we have our annual legumes. And so vetch, fava beans, crimson clover, and Austrian field peas are probably the most common ones that you're going to see. Um, the very top is the vetch, and then in the middle you can see are those root nodules. So the legumes add nitrogen back into the soil by taking the inaccessible atmospheric nitrogen and then they convert it into a form that plants are actually able to use. And then the very bottom is the red clover, the crimson clover. And one of the things that we like about the flower cover crops is that they are able to actually attract a whole bunch of pollinators and beneficial insects also because they're so early blooming. They also have a really strong deep root system so they help to break up those compacted soils. Um, and once again, just make sure you cut those flowers off before they go to seed because that's when you're gonna have a problem. So the vetch is different than the weedy perennial vetch you would see in your garden. And it's the clover is different than the white clover or the perennial versions that you see in your lawns oftentimes. So basics of pruning. Um, so this section is very high level. Um, I would say every section of pruning could be its own topic in itself. Um, there's a lot of great resources on the resource page um, on the City of Bothell website, and then also the CAS pruning book that Christy is going to be giving, um, sending out to somebody, um, is a great handbook to be able to have on hand. Um, I will hopefully be able to get through some of the basic questions, but um, there is an extra sheet that I added onto the resource page that goes into a little bit more depth also. So basic techniques. Um, Super, super important to know what plants you have um, and what their flowering time is, what the growth habit of those plants are. Um, you always wanna remove any sort of diseased branches first and foremost. Um, sanitize in between those cuts because some diseases can be transferred to other types of plants. Removing anything that's dead or super crisscrossy that is causing um, restricting airflow because that can cause diseases down the road. And then anything that is tree-like shrubs um, or even some other types of trees um, that need to be renovated or fixed really takes time. You don't wanna do that all in one year because the plants can react drastically. So think about it as a long-term commitment to reshape or refix something. Um, every time you make a cut, take a minute and stand back and relook at it because when you're in the plant trying to take a cut, it looks totally different than when you stand back. Um, what may look like a little tiny branch you're cutting could open up a huge hole or vice versa. So just take your time, look at it, and be slow um, when you're doing it. It's easier to cut something small than it is to try to put something back on. Um, basic tools. So there's lots of different types of tools out there. These are probably the most common ones that people end up using and should have on hand. Um, hand pruners range in all different sizes depending on what size of a branch you're trying to cut um, and what your hand, how big your hand is. So hand pruners generally you're cutting branches from a quarter inch to three quarters of an inch. Anything above that you're going to start kind of ripping the plant, which is then when you would want to get up to what we call pruning loppers. Um, and so that's anywhere from a three quarter inch to a two inch. And there's two different kinds. There's the bypass and the anvil. 
Um, and that just has to do with the type of blade that you have on there and whether it crisscrosses back and forth or whether it kind of um, has one sharp side and then a flat side that it's bouncing onto. Um, I usually only use the bypass, not the anvil, um, but some people have different preferences. Saws can be great for anything above that. You can also get smaller saws for kind of little tiny nooks and crannies if you want to get in there too. Um, having a good sharpener and also oil is also really important to keep your um, tools nice and clean. Um, I've used rubbing alcohol to kind of disinfect in between. Um, you just want to make sure that you're not overly drying them out. So that's why the oil is also important so that you don't have rusting being a problem later. So basic cuts. Um, two of the main ones are thinning and then heading. And so thinning, um, as you can see in these pictures, is when you're pruning back to where a branch or stem originally started on a branch or a trunk. So you're picking the tip and going back to where it started. Whereas heading, you're cutting off the tip and which causes it to then force it to bush out. So oftentimes that's what you would see if someone is um, hedging a boxwood hedge. They're just cutting off the tips of it to make it shrub out and bush out more. We don't usually like to do that because it can, it's harder to maintain. They react really quickly. So it's nice to be able to take the time to do selective heading if you're gonna do that so that you end up, actually the plant grows, it looks a little bit more natural as it grows rather than just being a sheared ball. Uh, depends what you have growing and what your style is, but some plants definitely you want to make sure that you're doing a selective heading versus just shearing it as you're moving forward. So basics. Spring through March um, is kind of, spring is usually kind of March through June is what we really think about. It's the fastest growth period and so any pruning that you're doing is going to stimulate growth you want to use that time of year to really focus on any branches that were broken through winter or from animals that have gone through. You really want to refrain from pruning certain types of plants that do what we call bleeding and that's when their sap is really running. So plants like dogwoods, grapes, birches, maples, and walnuts you don't want to do in the springtime. Uh, they, it stresses them out and so you want to wait on doing those types of plants. In the spring, if you were, if you want to encourage growth, you could do that pruning, but uh, it really, plants react very quickly and they grow very, very fast with the pruning in the springtime. So just some examples of what to think about with spring blooming is they oftentimes are, the blooms are from last year. So you want to prune as soon as the flowers have faded because otherwise you will cut off those buds that have been forming and then you won't have blooms the next year. So something to think about in timing when you're pruning those types of plants. And then think, and I have on the resource sheet a list of some of the spring blooming plants so that you can have an idea of what some of those are. For summer, we consider June through August. And these are usually our hot, dry summers. And so it's a really, really hard time on plants to do any sort of pruning. And it can um, oftentimes really stress them out. Another thing that happens is when you do prune large areas, it exposes other leaves or bark. And that can actually, they can get sunburned. So just like people, plants get sunburned too. So just something to think about. If you're doing it, be very careful about how you're pruning and how much you're pruning. It's a really good time to deadwood. And so that's trying to find any sort of branches that maybe have died over the winter or earlier in the spring that you couldn't see before. When all of the leaves are out or you can see flower buds, it's a lot easier time to recognize that deadwood. Another way to see deadwood if you can't quite tell, because some plants it's hard to tell, take your fingernail and just scrape the bark. And if the bark underneath the cambium layer is green, it's still alive. If it's more of a brown or a gray and a little bit drier looking, then it's the dead, that's actually dead wood. So you can go ahead and cut that off. Plants that are prune, uh, prone, excuse me, prone to water sprouting, 
um, dogwood trees, cherries, crab apples, plums, magnolias, witch hazels, and deciduous viburnum. Uh, it's a good time to prune them because plants are slowing down and aren't growing as quickly. They kind of shut down. Uh, it's a good time to prune those. And then also if you have plants that water sprouts have already formed on, prune those off. So early summer, you can prune spring blooming plants and late summer you want to prune um, if you want to kind of reduce the growth and so that's kind of with those water sprouting plants. So bloom on current year's growth are oftentimes the summer blooming types of plants and then like I said just being aware of how hot or dry it is because if you have a really hot dry year plants are going to react they're not going to react or bounce back as quickly so if it's one of those years where it's extra hot or dry, just maybe wait and don't prune as much. Juice do a little tiny bit or just wait until it's a better time of the year to be able to hit those plants. So with fall, we kind of consider September through November. So this is a time when heading back cuts um, can stimulate growth on semi-hardy plants. So you wanna be careful about frost damage because this time of the year, they're starting to grow a little bit again. And so what happens when you prune something is it triggers a growth hormone and it makes them put out new growth. So you wanna be very careful about doing that. Um, it can, our droughts can continue to lengthen through September sometimes, so just being cautious. Fungal diseases are more prominent because our fall rains start coming back. And so that's a, something to be thinking about any sort of plants that are susceptible to fungal disease, you wanna make sure that you're not doing too much pruning. It's a good time for thinning and also doing continuing to deadwood as you go through. Um, and also as we start to move through, the leaves start dropping you can see the structure of plants. And so it's a lot easier for you to be able to see what um, branch might be overlapping or maybe kind of creating a weird space that you don't quite want. So just know that it can also encourage growth on plants too. So just thinking about what that with the different types of plants that you have. So some of the examples of some fall blooming plants, Calicarpa right now should have a whole bunch of those purple berries on it, the Camellia sasanqua, rhododendrons, and also Mahonia. Um, there is also different types of Camellias and rhododendrons that bloom at different times. So making sure you know which one you are pruning so that you're not pruning off some of the flower buds for the following year. Winter is considered December through February. Uh, late winter is a really good time to see that structure. So once again, similar to fall, being able to see the leaves, um, it can encourage some regrowth. Usually you're not gonna see too much of that unless it's a pretty warm year when we don't have a super, super cold winter. It's a good time to prune deciduous plants. Um, stone fruits such as our plums, our cherries, uh, peaches, nectarines, any of those are going to be more susceptible to the disease. So similar to our fall. So you really want to do a lot of those pruning in uh, like early summer or late summer. Um, also being aware of the drought times so that you're not going to encourage any sort of disease issues with those. So some examples of winter blooming are witch hazel, viburnum pink dawn, the sarcococcus, winter hazel, and then also the edworthia. These are all really beautiful plants to have in the winter too because they're some of those super, super early blooming plants when we're really needing to have a little bit of something after our, our dark, dreary days. And with that, here is our resources. Um, so Plant Amnesty, I just want to point them out real fast. They have some excellent videos, YouTube videos on pruning and specifically on all different types of shrubs and also on um, just kind of basics of years and seasons and all of that too. Um, the guide to pruning from Cass Turnbull, Turnbull is excellent. Um, to really dive into a little bit more. The um, resource sheet that I have up also goes into depth about roses, ground covers, um, vines, trees. It talks about the different types of structures. 
there was just no way that I could fit all of that into this slideshow. Um, so please take a look at the different resources that are on there. With that, I'm gonna stop sharing and see if people have any sort of questions. Oh, you are muted, Christy. <laughs> I was actually just pretending, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do have some questions. Uh, let's see. And thank you for all that, Selena. That was a ton of information. And just oh, God. <laughs> want to remind you all, we have, um, we'll put the PDF of this presentation as well as the actual recording of it on the resource page that I sent you. In, along with the Zoom link today. So that should be all updated. It'll probably be by tomorrow afternoon, I assume, and then I'll send that out to everyone. Um, I also put something in the chat box about a seasonal yard maintenance calendar. I just added that link to the resource page as all. Well. It, it goes over some of the things that Selena already mentioned. Uh, so we're ready to officially begin the Q&A session and we are scheduled till 8.30, so we have a bit of time. I've got a number of questions in the chat box that I'll ask to Selena. If you have any others, please feel free to type, type them now. And just a reminder, if we do run out of time, uh, the Garden Hotline is an excellent resource and you also have that link in the email that I sent you today. I think while we're doing the Q&A, we may as well put up our second and final set of poll questions also, just to give you a chance to kind of answer those those questions while Selena's answering your questions. I Again, uh, anyone who answers these questions will be entered for one of three fabulous prizes. Mm -hmm. Also, Selena was talking about Cass Turnbull, who we're giving away one of her books tonight. But on the resource page, if you haven't looked at that, under the video section, I know we have a link. I think it's like a six part series that she does on pruning techniques. She really really gets into it there. So I yep. would highly recommend watching that as well. Yeah, I agree. So let me start with the questions here. Okay. Okay, Selena, for veggies that are biennial, if we don't want to make seeds, should we pull them at the end of the season? Or is there another reason that we should allow them to come back? Um, I mean, so stuff like my kale, I usually leave in so I'll plant kale in the spring or early summer and I'll let it go through the winter and let it grow into the spring the following year. And I'll usually pull it right before the heat comes because that's when it's gonna start going to seed. And so that way I'm able to have, it's a, such an early crop because it can make it through our winters that I like to keep it in through winter just because it means that I have something to eat in the springtime before everything else is ready to come out. So. It depends on if you want to have something in to eat early or also if you're trying to make up space and plant something different. So just, just kind of thinking about those two things when you go through. Okay, this is a question about soaker hoses. Is it okay to use them in your veggie gardens, especially if they're made of something like recycled, tiker, recycled tires, is there a concern <laughs> about them breaking down in your veggie garden? Um, I've used them in my veggie garden. Um, there is different types of materials. I'm not super familiar if they have other types of soaker hoses that aren't something like a recycled tire. There might be some that might be better for vegetable gardens. Um, I generally use soaker hoses in shrub beds. Um, and then I use drip line, which is generally made for vegetable gardens or um, what they call drip tape which is similar to a soaker hose, but made for vegetable gardens. I do worry sometimes about any sort of leaching of chemicals from some of that sort of stuff. So just something to think about. I'd have to do more research about that specific product. Um, I usually, like I said, I usually use them in perennial and shrub beds and stuff like that. So just something to think about, especially if you're more sensitive to different chemicals. Okay, for soil testing, do you recommend that people do that themselves or should they send it out to a company? Uh, perhaps maybe one of the conservation districts? 
Yeah, so oftentimes the soil tests that you can get in, I don't know, say Fred Meyer, or Lowe's, or Home Depot, um, you can get, they'll have a little package and it'll have a nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium generally, and maybe pH that you can test. Those are a good beginner start. Uh, they're not as accurate. And you also don't get as much information as you do if you send them into a lab. So I know King Conservation District works with a lab called ANL down in Portland. It's $20 if you are not, um, if you're just getting their basic test. And their basic test is nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, sodium. Um, I feel like there's one other one in there that I'm forgetting about. Oh, magnesium. Um, and then they also have pH, soil organic percentage, the cation exchange too, and they give you recommendations. So the important thing is that they, all of those different nutrients along with the pH and the cation exchange all actually work together and are affecting each other. And so it's nice to have all of that. So yes, I do recommend as a long answer there, um, send it into a lab to get it done. You're just going to get a lot more information. Uh, they can be very confusing with their analysis they send back. So you're always welcome to email the garden hotline a copy of your soil analysis and we can help walk you through the recommendations for what to do for your yard. When you do send in a soil test, make sure you tell them whether it's a vegetable garden, a lawn, a perennial bed, because there's going to be different recommendations for what your soil test is going to show based on what you're planting. So just make sure you're giving them as much information so that you can have as much information. Okay, if you have a raised garden, would you add a cover crop to your raised beds? Um, I do cover crops in like raised vegetable beds. Um, and you can do them in containers. The one time I wouldn't do a cover crop um, would be probably like in a shrub bed or like a perennial bed. Um, you could do it around trees possibly, um, but definitely I've done it in as small as just like a one foot pot and I've done it in a large raised garden bed. Uh, if you have a vegetable bed where you have stuff that you're overwintering, you might not want to do it because you don't want to have to disturb that, um, the roots around them. Um, so then would be a good time to put like leaves or maybe burlap or straw or something else around them in that sense. Okay, is now a good time to plant a fruit tree? Maybe something like a dwarf apple? Yeah, now is a great time to do any sort of what we call, like a lot of times you'll see fruit trees for sale right now. Spring and fall are great times because they're dormant or going into dormancy. And so they're kind of at that time where you get them in the ground, it's cool outside. They're able to kind of put their energy into growing a root structure and not trying to leaf out and do all of the blooming. So yes, now is a great time to do fruit trees, shrubs, um, perennials even. It's, and then also spring bulbs because they need to go through our cold temperatures to initiate them to bloom. So crocus, daffodils, tulips. Now is when you want to plant all of those too. What about lawn mowing? Should people continue mowing their lawn from this point forward? Do they just kind of give it a break throughout the fall and winter? Yeah, I would say you probably could get another, I mean, it depends what the rains too um, and how wet your lawn is, but you should definitely still be mowing, I would say probably till the end of October at least, just keep an eye on that weather. Um, you just don't, because you're all not going to be able to mow in the winter time. It's just going to be too wet in the lawn. Your lawn's probably going to be a little soggy just because we get a lot of rain. Um, but yeah, definitely do a, do a little bit more mowing and then it will start to stop growing. It'll kind of slow itself down once we get into those colder temperatures. And so it won't grow too much more. And then in the springtime, March, April-ish, you'll start to see the grass will start to grow as we get a couple of warmer days and you can get back out and mow your lawn again. So when I know spring is here is when I can start to smell the fresh cut grass, so. <laughs> can you talk a little more about hydrangeas? What is the best time to prune them or to deadhead them? So with hydrangeas, um, generally we don't actually do a lot of 
pruning on hydrangeas. Uh, the deadheading, there's different types. The oak leaf hydrangea, I would say, I generally don't deadhead until full on spring because they actually hold their flowers so well. Um, and also their leaves, they almost, they're kind of like a semi deciduous, semi evergreen because they're able to hold those leaves through winter, which is what's so great. And the flowers just really balance them out. With the other types of hydrangeas, depending on where you are, if you get a colder frost than maybe some other areas, a lot of times they say to hold to keep the flower heads on because it protects the new buds. So I generally don't deadhead my hydrangeas until the spring when I've already seen at least two or three sets of new growth starting to come out just to make sure to protect those flower buds because it just creates this little kind of blanket over the top of those buds. Um, if you are doing any sort of pruning on them, you what you want to do is cut any of the dead out first, um, any sort of really big crisscrossy that's happening. Um, and then if you're going to do any sort of anything else, any sort of branches that are two or three years old, you can take those out and to encourage some new growth to come up. But oftentimes, unless it's just too big and in the wrong space, you might need to just move it because you're going to constantly be fighting it. Okay, is it a good time to plant tulip bulbs? And on a related note, if you are going to plant tulip bulbs, can you plant them in between rose bushes? Uh, yes, now is a great time to plant them. Um, and then also, I would say you could probably plant them in between your roses. I don't see why not. Um, the one thing with tulips to think about is that squirrels really like them. Um, so being aware of that, um, the squirrels will try and dig them up. And so you will probably want to put either some sort of mesh. Um, I've seen people put like extra large chicken wire over the top and then put mulch over the top of that because then the tulips can grow through it but the squirrels can't get the bulb out. So try that because they will try and go after them. Can we go back to a definition? You talked about water sprouts. What yes. does that mean? So um, if you I'm trying to think of what people might see, just like draw something. <laughs> Um, so there's some plants when you prune them. So I guess a good example is fruit trees. If you prune a fruit tree in the springtime, um, what they'll do is when you cut a branch, um, it causes them to put out a whole bunch of little tiny shoots that go straight up. So I'm just gonna, this is gonna be a terrible picture. I'm not a drawing, but so I already messed up, okay. So here's a branch, this is very simple. Okay, very simple branch. If you were to cut the top off, what would happen is it would then, so you cut the top and then it would go to where you just have a whole bunch of little tiny branches that go straight off the top. And so it starts to change the shape of the tree and so what happens is those water sprouts just end up, it looks like a witch's broom coming off the top. And so that's the plant reacting to being cut. And so it happens oftentimes from certain types of plants. And so those are what we call water sprouts. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> it does. <laughs> now a question about juniper. So mm -hmm. someone has a juniper that has been shaped into a spiral topiary, mm -hmm. but the top of one of them has died. Should they cut the top of that one off? Um, probably it's not. Most likely if the top is actually dead, it's not going to come back. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've, I've cut like topiaries like that before, and you can oftentimes just reshape that top. So just kind of look at that top and see if there's a way that you can maybe reshape the top of that topiary. Because of those spirals, there's usually a branch or two that are kind of overlapping and you might be able to cut one off to just reshape it. It will take a year or two to kind of fill back in, but it's definitely, if it's dead up at the top, it's not gonna come back. Um, so just also keep in mind, keep, an eye, keep watching it to see if it starts to die off anywhere else to make sure there's not something else going on. Um, like some sort of pest issue or a watering issue. 
All right, what is the best timing or strategy for pruning purple smoke bush to control overall size? I get a ton of sprouts. Yeah, so that's just unfortunately nature of those trees. Um, you, so kind of like I was saying, so they, they want to grow a lot. And so doing some selective pruning, so doing more of what we call a thinning cut rather than a heading cut. Um, people will head cut smoke trees to get this really big bushy. And so that's a lot of times what people end up doing. I find it's easier if you take and thin out whatever that tallest branch is, cut that back and shortening it that way rather than trying to cut the whole thing. Find that tallest branch and take that down and that will overall shorten the tree. Um, and then doing that probably in like late summer-ish um, because that's gonna, it's when it's not trying to actively grow as much. Whereas if you do in the spring, it's gonna wanna just react and put out a lot of different sprouts. Okay, now does it help to, does it help to deadhead knockout roses and camellia for longer blooming season? And what's the best way to do this? Uh, yes, so if you wanna encourage more flower growth, um, you do wanna continue deadheading. Um, and this is in with most flowering plants, not all, but most flowering plants. What they're doing is they're trying to reproduce and so they're trying to end their life cycle. And so when something goes to flower, it's trying to go to seed. And when it goes to seed, it's stopping its growth. And so if you cut those flowers off, you're encouraging it to keep trying to do that. So that will encourage more of your flower growth. Um, deadheading you can do throughout the year. You're not cutting off a lot when you're doing that. You're only cutting off a bud or a couple of inches. So you're not gonna have to worry about hurting a plant with that. Um, with camellias, you don't necessarily see that as much. You don't deadhead them necessarily like you would a rose. Um, so camellias, I generally don't deadhead as, I would mainly just take off the bud once it's done. Whereas roses, I do tend to like actually cut an inch or two of the stem because they're actually creating a whole new branch that's then going to be the flower. Whereas the camellia is already creating those buds. It's not usually putting out a whole bunch of new buds. What's the best time to prune grapes? Is that something that could be done now? Yeah, I mean, so grapes are one of the ones, um, they need a little bit of constant maintenance because they do grow so much. Um, so you could definitely do some pruning now for sure. Um, it's gonna be easier to see when they're a little bit more dormant. So kind of in the springtime, because you're also trying to encourage them to bloom a bit, to grow a bit more too. Um, so now's a good time to just kind of start to get them back in. And then in the spring, doing the actual full maintenance prune, and then the summer doing another just kind of anything that's the little shoots that are just going a little crazy and bringing them back in so that you aren't shading any fruit that's forming. This question is, could you grow mushrooms in a nut tree or the top canopy level? Wait, can you repeat that? Sorry. It says, could you grow mushrooms in the nut tree or a top canopy level? Might need to ask a follow-up. Athena, if you want to unmute, just to kind of clarify the question, you are welcome to. Are you like a fir tree, if you can grow? I'm trying to understand. Wait, we can come back to that one in a minute. I'll see if, um, I'll send Yeah, Athena, if you could give me a little bit more information, I would love to be able to answer that for you. Uh, Next question. Oh, there you are, Athena. Yeah, um, so I've been studying, taking a chats about um, mushroom glass. I know some, of them, some species grow on trees, some grow on the ground. And some mushroom species only grow on certain species of trees. Yes. So those mushrooms that do grow on trees, um, uh, would that be on the canopy level or would that be maybe on like the lowest level in a bed with chips? Um, so let's see, if you were going to try and do it yourself, um, I mean, I've seen, I've never generally seen mushroom first off mushrooms are not my expertise i will say that right now um but i know that you can inoculate different 
types of logs and being able to put them at a ground level. It's mainly their react their relationship with the tree itself. Um, in the natural forest, I don't normally see them in the higher levels. I normally see them more at like a mid level on the trees. Um, but that would be something I'd have to do a little bit more research on and specifically on like which mushroom. Um, but yeah, there is definitely very specific relationships that mushrooms have with specific types of trees. I do know that for sure. Um, for example, truffles, uh, they grow on oaks or filberts and they won't grow anywhere else and they grow in the soil. So, and then you'll have something like um, the um, lion's mane actually grows on the side of a tree. And so there is very specific relationships. Um, it is not my expertise. There is a lot of really great, there's the Mycological Society in Seattle and they have some really good classes and also resources that you can connect with them on. They have a Facebook page and they have weekly meetups or monthly meetups. And so I'm sure they would be able to help answer that question. And I can get that link to Christy to put on the resource page too, so that you can look into that also. Thank you. Yeah, it's something I want to learn more about. <laughs> so it's on my to-do list. For azaleas, someone has an azalea and says the big part, a big part of the front middle part just died this summer and the rest of the plant to both sides is fine. Do you know what could cause this and what to do? Um, so there's a couple of things that come to mind. Azaleas and rhodes, unfortunately, can be susceptible to different root diseases and fungus that can cause it. They also are very susceptible to drought issues. I know it doesn't seem like we have drought conditions, but we do in the summertime. Uh, I would say definitely first check and think about what your watering is like then kind of digging maybe an inch or two down the soil and just seeing what the soil is like if the root if the trunk is being covered up by any sort of soil it can help it can cause damage to the trunks which can then cause problems um if you've seen any sort of pest issues there's root weevils that can eat the roots on azaleas and rhodes and that can be a really big problem um, Usually if there's one branch that's dying, it's oftentimes a root issue or something in the soil. So I definitely recommend digging into that and checking it out first. Also take a picture and email it to us at the hotline and it will help us to be able to see what's going on. So like an up close picture of like the leaves and then also standing back so we can see what the overall structure is and how it's changing. And then even the base where the soil is, so we can see what that looks like and we can hopefully be able to try and figure out what's going on. Going back to hydrangeas for a second. Yeah. Huge hydrangea is a problem every year. Can I take out many of the older canes and how much can I cut it down and when? This is for a client. It says they took out many canes last year and they pruned it down but it still got gigantic and flowered <laughs> profusely. <laughs> And it still will, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, you're not going to be able to fully control it because it's going to do what it wants to do. Um, so it might be time to talk to the client about potentially moving it. Um, because, yeah, I mean, you did what you, what I would do, taking out the older canes, but it's still, it's going to put out a new cane and those new canes can also grow almost the full, in two years, they can get the full height again. Um, and I mean, I've, I don't do it as much anymore, but I mean, I've pruned hydrangeas back to almost a foot from the ground and within a year they're back up again. So, uh, it's definitely something that can, you might just need to try and convince them that it's never going to be what they want it to be, unfortunately. Um, yeah. <laughs> Someone's asking about planting tulips in pots and then planting the pots in the ground. Is mm -hmm. that, do you think that might help protect them from the squirrels at all? Yeah, um, except for the squirrels will still get in the pots, but it'll be easier to, it'll be easier to protect them there. Uh, I have a squirrel nest in my tree outside my house and they have gone all the way up onto my deck, onto my patio furniture, and they completely dug up um, all of my pots. So, 
Um, they don't care. <laughs> they have a mind of their own. But yeah, putting some sort of netting or something over the top will help. Um, I have also heard and tried and recommended for other types of rodents mixing cayenne pepper in a spray bottle with a little bit of soap or oil because the cayenne is spicy, like they don't like the spicy. So you can try that too. So, yeah. Someone has a black knight butterfly bush that's out of control. She says it's practically a tree that at its, that at its um, point, highest point, I think it's wider than it is tall. <laughs> that massive pruning can harm a plant. How much could I cut off safely without killing it? And is this a thing to prune in the fall or in the spring? Um, I'm trying to think with the black knight butterfly bush. I know with almost all butterfly bush, you can cut them to the ground anytime and they will come back within one or two years. Um, I don't know about the black knight specifically, so I'd have to look up that variety. Um, I would definitely say you could start to do some pruning on it now um, and it would help to control a little bit of it. In the springtime, I, let's see, you would want, yeah, because they're still blooming a little bit right now. Most of them are. So you could totally cut it back uh, because it's also nice to be able to control some of the seeds. And then I think the black knight is not one of the invasive versions, so, which is good. Um, but yeah, I would say you could probably prune a majority of it back. Um, as far as how much, I would maybe don't take, maybe don't cut more than half. Um, but also thinking about trying to kind of do the thinning where you're taking whatever that tallest branch is and cutting that back. The general rule of thumb for doing any kind of major pruning on plants that react, so like fruit trees react really drastically, you don't ever want to do more than a third of it every year because the plant will start to think it's dying and that's when it really goes crazy and starts to react. So if you're concerned about it being too crazy or about the potential of it like hurting it, don't do more than a third of the overall canopy size and also just height and just take it down a little bit this year and then wait until spring and do another little bit. Um, and just though be aware in spring that if you do a lot, it's gonna to react too. So just doing it a slow process and just trying to take down some of those biggest branches uh, to try and get it back into, into shape. Butterfly bushes are generally pretty resilient plants to begin with. So it's not one I would worry too much about, um, but also I wouldn't cut it to the ground because you might actually lose it, especially if we had a hard frost and that's what's kind of hard. You just need to, it's hard to know with what our weather is gonna do. What is the best time, if you have a hydrangea that you do want to transplant, what's the best time to do that? You can do it now. Um, you can do it now or in the springtime. And so you, if you do it, I mean, either now or in the spring, either one of them are gonna be fine. I would, dig as much around that root ball as you possibly can to just protect any of those roots. And then one technique I like to do is to either take a tarp or something and slide it kind of next to it and just kind of scoot it underneath that root ball and then wrap it kind of like a blanket around it because it's easier to move the root ball like that than it is say um, under like with a shovel where you're potentially gonna break some chunks of it off. So you just kind of want to baby it a little bit to move it. And then when you dig that hole, just dig the hole as big as that root ball is that you dug up. And then one thing you can do is add a little bit of um, a fertilizer that's higher in phosphorus or that has B12 in it because those help with transplant shock and encouraging root growth. So that way you know you're kind of giving it a good spot, um, a good start water it in really well even if we are getting rains because you are disrupting that root system and putting a good mulch layer around it will help to protect it going into winter. Okay how do you promote English laurel growth and are they suitable for shady areas? Um, I would say you don't need to worry about English laurel growth. They usually are pretty good at growing. Um, they're not something you need to consider worrying too much about. If you want them to grow more, pruning them in the springtime will encourage them to grow because that's when they're coming out of dormancy and wanting to grow. Um, and they can handle some shade. Uh, they still, they're not going to be as 
full, they're going to stretch a little bit, but they can handle quite a bit of shade. So just thinking about what the structure is that you want it to end up looking like, it will be more compact and less stretched out in between the leaf nodes if it is in more sun, but they can handle quite a bit of shade. Well, that's, I think I'm looking through the chat here. That's, I think all we have for questions at this point. If anyone has any other questions, we do have a few more minutes left while you're thank thinking. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Selena, thank you for sharing your expertise with us. I'm kind of relieved at how well the online platform worked. <laughs> and yeah. who knows? I mean, time will tell if we'll be doing it this way again next year. Um, I do miss seeing everyone in person, though. I like the energy and the enthusiasm that the participants bring to the class. So I know we can't see you all face to face right now, but we definitely appreciate your, your eagerness to learn this stuff. Yeah. And hope that and you found I, it useful. I saw Christine just asked where to send info. Um, you can email, I'm gonna just put in the chat box, help at gardenhotline.org. Make sure you spelled it right, help at garden hotline. So you can email us at help at gardenhotline.org. Um, any questions about composting, chicken care, lawn care, um, house plants, vegetable gardens, pretty much anything. Um, and you can also call us. Um, and I will put that phone number in there too. And we are, I'm, we're there to try and be there six days a week, nine to five to answer our phones, but you can also leave us a voicemail and we will call you back. So you can do that too. And the links and all that information is also gonna be um, on the resource page that Christy has too. Oh, we have a chicken question. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Should this person heat the chicken coop? It says I don't have a deep litter. What no. do you know about chickens, Selena? <laughs> I, I know about chickens. <laughs> um, you do not need to heat the chicken coop. They will be just fine. Um, just make sure that they have an indoor space that's covered in the winter so they can get out of the rain. But they have their feathers and they are just fine with that. Um, just make sure their water doesn't freeze. Yes, even in the snow, they will be just fine. Um, Chickens originally came from like Russia and up like in very, very cold areas. So I had chickens for eight years, six years, and never lost one due to any cold. Um, like I said, if you are concerned, you can put a heat lamp in, but you really don't need to. The, only, the main reason that people put lights in are so that their chickens continue laying through the winter time. So what happens is as the sun and the light gets less, they start to go and they stop laying. And so that's more of what people worry about than anything. I would say if you're gonna worry, if you'd have to be in a really, really cold environment for an extended period of time where I would worry about heat for any sort of chickens. So you should be just fine. Just make sure their water doesn't freeze because that's the big thing. Knit some little chicken sweaters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions? You can unmute and just jump in if you have one. <laughs> Feel free. Selena and I were talking before this workshop about timing for next year's workshops. Mm -hmm. The past few years we've done fall workshops and actually we were supposed to have a spring series this year uh, that included, you know, container gardening, a, a demonstration on that and pollinator gardening, all kinds of really fun spring stuff. And I doubt we'll be able to do that in person next spring. So we're kind of kind of debating whether to do an online spring one or continue with fall. So I'll probably be asking all of this year's participants um, what you all prefer too, as far as timing and what you thought of this format. Again, I'm really relieved it worked, worked as well as it did and that so many <laughs> of you were able to join. Yeah, me too. 
it is nice to be able to get people from all different spaces. We're able to reach, I think, huh? a, a wider audience because of, at least location wise. Uh -huh. And I didn't have to go to Costco for refreshments. So <laughs> thanks for saving my sanity there. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. Well, we are at our time. So thank you again for joining us. And we will, I'll send everyone a link to the updated resource page probably by the end of the day tomorrow, Friday at the latest. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Thank you.